for joining us for this session on shaping a just plastics economy at the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit. I'm Catherine Cheney. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I'm delighted to be moderating this conversation. The first half of this session will be on the record, recorded, and publicly available afterwards, and the second half of this conversation will be held under the Chatham House rule. So now to set the stage a little bit in terms of the problem we're discussing and, and hopefully the way forward. So we're all familiar with the problem of plastic pollution, but today we'll explore how it affects people from around the world in different ways. In a moment, I'll introduce some of our expert panelists, but first I'd love to get a sense of what each of you think about the topic we're tackling today. So I'd like to introduce our first Slido poll, which you'll see pop up in the chat. And I encourage you to click and answer just so we get a read of the room here. We hear a lot in the news about how certain marginalized groups, such as those living in poverty, migrants and refugees, indigenous peoples and women are disproportionately affected by plastics pollution. But we hear less about their participation in solutions to such pollution. So the question posed in Slido here is, in which of the following segments of the value chain do traditionally marginalized groups play a critical role in the transition to a circular plastics economy? Product design, production, use and consumption, collection, or maybe you're not sure. And multiple selections are possible. So uh, as we see those uh, responses come in, I just wanna talk a little bit more about um, how to use Slido. Uh, that's gonna be where you post questions um, if you'd like to pose any questions to our panelists. And we also encourage you to, to post any comments in the chat for those joining us here live. Um, just to talk a little bit more about what we'll be discussing today. We all know that this current take, make, waste, linear approach to plastic production and consumption isn't working anymore and won't work moving forward. There are high costs for people and our planet. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which has been a real leader in this space, uh, provides a really useful definition of a new plastics economy. It's one in which plastic never becomes waste or pollution. And three actions are required here. First, eliminate all problematic and unnecessary plastic items. Second, innovate to ensure that the plastics we do need are reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And third, circulate all the plastic items we use to keep them in the economy and out of the environment. The plastics value chain can be thought of to include both upstream elements like product design and production and downstream aspects like use, reuse, collection, and recycling. Uh, and in that poll, we'll get a sense of uh, where you see inclusion being most critical, um, perhaps in one part of the value chain or across the value chain. And we'll dive into that topic a little further in just a moment. As I mentioned earlier, the plastics economy as it is today has a disproportionate impact on people from traditionally marginalized communities. I wanna note something um, that I found really useful in understanding these impacts from a United Nations Environment Program report on the environmental justice impacts of marine litter and plastic pollution. And it notes that women are more likely to be exposed to toxins from the use of plastic, which is predominant in domestic and feminine products. Improperly di disposed of plastic ends up in marine ecosystems where it threatens the livelihood of those who rely on fishing to survive and threatens the health of those who consume it by mistake in their seafood. And in addition, people who make a living waste picking are disproportionately exposed to its, to to its toxins. So those, those are just a few examples to really ground us in, in what this means for people every day and, and how they can actually be part of the solution. That's what we'll be focusing on in our conversation. Um, I, I want to note that this conversation is convened by the World Economic Forum's Global Plastic Action Partnership. So one of the things I find really exciting about this conversation is we're not just going to have this conversation and move on with our day. These insights will really be used, fed into the partnership uh, to inform what they do moving forward. And this GPAP partnership uh, basically breaks down inclusion across the value, plastics value chain, thinking about regulators, policymakers, decision makers, market actors, so business owners, leaders, entrepreneurs, workers, both informal and formal, consumers, and community members. And when GPAP, for example, considers women workers in the plastics economy, that might include what does it look like for women workers, both in the formal and informal economy, when it comes to their access, their power, their decision making within existing structures, and how might that look in the future? So again, this session is part of GPAP's commitment to integrate diverse voices across the partnership. We have some of those voices uh, formally formally included as panelists in this first half of the session. And then we want to hear all your voices in the second half of the session. So get really get ready for a really action-oriented conversation. Uh, before we dive into our panel, um, and I'd love to take a look at that poll, if we have our 
results here. Can we take a look? Did we get more responses coming in? I, I might return to this question later on. So let's see. I'm going to see if I can zoom in. Uh, all right, use and consumption and collection. So it looks like uh, in, when you think about segments of the value chain where traditionally marginalized groups play a critical role, it's in use and consumption and collection, not so much these other stages. So we'll see if those perspectives change over the course of the conversation. But I want to go ahead and introduce uh, the Honorable Jean d'Arc Mujawamaria, who's Minister of Environment of Rwanda, for some opening remarks. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Catherine. Distinguished guests, friends of the environment, greetings from Kigali, Rwanda. It's a pleasure to be part of this important discussion. And thanks to the World Economic Forum and the Global Plastic Action Partnership for convening today's event and for the chance to share Rwanda's effort in addressing plastic pollution. Around the world, awareness is growing that plastic pollution is not only dangerous for marine life, but all living things, including the humanity. This is something environmentalists have to know for a, have known for a long time. In 2003, almost two decades ago, Wanda conducted a study on the impact of plastic bag pollution. It showed an overwhelming negative impact of plastic bags on both natural and man-made environment. The case for action was clear. The campaign to educate about the danger of plastic bags started in Rwanda in 2004 through our monthly Umuganda Community Works Initiative. Rwandans in all corners of the country were called on to collect all the plastic waste they could find in the nature. A huge amount was collected and kept for recycling. Furthermore, I can share that His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, President Paul Kagame, used to go an extra mile. In addition of participating in such community works, he confessed that he randomly stopped on the road to correct such waste, plastic waste, while driving to or from his office. This event helped citizens, as well as leaders, to see the problem of plastic pollution with their own eyes. If the president can stop, why can't I? Decision makers began thinking about how to reduce plastic bags and a ministerial instruction was adopted to limit the use of or the manufacture of plastic bags in Rwanda. Then, ladies and gentlemen, in 2008, the parliament passed a law banning plastic bags. Ten years later, we went further and revised the plastics law to ban all single-use plastics and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of plastic recycling in the country. Today, we have an extended producer responsibility system in place whereby private operators importing plastics must contribute to a fund to manage the waste produced from their products, which we call environmental levy. Rwanda's effort to beat plastic pollution would not have been possible without the daily work of sanitation workers. 
every day. Hundreds of cleaners walk tirelessly to keep our city Kigali clean. Wanda's strict enforcement of the plastics ban has also created opportunities in our informal sector, whereby people collect plastic waste and sell it to the recycling companies. So for our communities, no waste is wasted. Today, we have a robust plastic recycling industry, as well as an, a new waste recycling sector that is positioning Rwanda as a regional hub for turning trash into treasure. The number of youth-led startups in the plastic the repurposing give us confidence that we are on the right track. Recently, Rwanda and Peru joined forces to propose a global plastic treaty that will reduce plastics in our environment. Turbo charge the circular economy for plastics and improve the health and well-being of all life on Earth. It is logical and practical next step in our effort to address the dual climate and biodiversity crisis. It is only through this kind of action from the global community that we can transform our plastic addicted economies to be cycle powerhouse that not only deliver social economic prosperity, but also restore the natural world. The Global Plastic Action Partnership is playing a critical role to achieve this. And Rwanda is proud to support this work. So we have to be the change we, we want to see in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let us go to action. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And I really appreciate that you emphasize the approach here, um, not just the actions you've taken, but how you've taken them and what lessons there might be for other countries looking to do the same. So thank you so much for your time and insight. I'd love to introduce our panelists now. Joining us from Brazil is Sonia Diaz, Waste Specialist for Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, which is a global network focused on empowering the working poor with a particular focus on women. We're also joined by Marcus Horher. He's the Director of Sustainability and Public Affairs at Borealis, which is a provider of innovative solutions in the fields of plastics, chemicals, and fertilizers. And finally, Joshua Amhonsem, He's the founder and executive director of Green Africa Youth Organization, which is a Ghana-based advocacy organization dedicated to environmental sustainability and community development. So I'd love to start with a question on why social inclusion is so critical when it comes to working toward a circular economy for plastics. Basically, why is the topic we're tackling today so critical and so urgent? And Sonia, maybe we can start with you. Thank you very much. This is such an important uh, question. Uh, yeah, I think we, we need to start by acknowledging that uh, waste has been a resource for the urban poor for many centuries. It's how they have earned their livelihoods for many centuries, and it's still so today. So if we think about today's waste pickers, we have around one to 2% of the urban population working on waste picking. And by waste pickers here, we can consider those that uh, collect, sort and or process household, commercial and industrial waste, be it on the streets or in cooperatives, 
in recycling facilities or in open and controlled dumps, which is actually, uh, you know, part of, uh, you know, this reality. Most of waste pickers work in these places. So waste pickers have been contributing actually to curbing plastic pollution in our oceans and without proper recognition from governments and from the industry. Uh, and waste speakers contribute in so many ways to reducing plastic uh, pollution. And I'll mention just two here because, uh, yeah, they extract organic materials uh, from unlined dump sites, which stops toxins from seeping into groundwater and into our ocean environments. And they provide collection services that prevent open waste burning, which can pollute the ocean. And sometimes they are providing the only waste collection systems that there, there is in, in some cities. So. Waste pickers collection systems, whether they are recognized and or included as service providers by municipalities or not, they provide raw materials at low prices to recycling industries and thus they do contribute to resource conservation, they contribute to pollu pollution uh, reduction and to climate change mitigation they thereby perform an environmental service. And it's about time that we acknowledge their contribution in circular systems. Thank you, okay. Sonia. Yeah, so it sounds like they are already part of the solution, but not necessarily recognized as such. And that's what needs to change. Um, I really appreciate your thoughts there. And I wonder, um, Joshua, is this something you might want to comment on in terms of why this topic matters to you, making uh, this this value chain not just circular, but just and inclusive? Well, thank you very much. And I think uh, Sonia gave a very awesome beginning to the conversation, talking about sort of the role that informal economies play in the question of a circular economy and a just uh, a transition in this context. I think what, what I would like to mention is that in addition to the role they play, that role is significant and can only be enhanced and can serve a better purpose if the question of social inclusion, not just in the circular value chain, but also in the context of health, in the context of well-being, in the context of livelihoods, if all of that is integrated. And I think that is something that I'm very, very concerned about because during the COVID lockdown, for instance, we saw in certain cities and communities that informal waste workers were not able to play their role very well. And that is because of the different restrictions that were there uh, and, and they not being able to go out and clean the city. What that means for other people and other people, I mean, those living in sort of the slums and other neighborhoods where you don't have the upper class communities, what that meant is that all of those people were at a higher risk because of the lack of capacity to informal waste workers being able to play their function. And if you look at different city circular economy strategies and waste management strategies, typically the data behind that is focused on the formal sector because that is where you can measure, really measure how much of waste goes into the, into the bin, how much goes into a, a material recovery site or a landfill. All the work that is done by the informal economy is not there. And if you look at social protection policies, social protection uh, interventions, you're using data to, pro to produce these interventions and policies. And if you cut away the work of the informal economy and the work of uh, informal waste workers, that means that all those interventions do not fit, are not fit for purpose. So it is really important that we look at social inclusion, but we should look at it also from the angle of not just the informal waste workers themselves, but in a city and in a community, people who are low, not low-income people in the community, they are really going to be at a higher risk if informal uh, waste economy uh, players do not, are not able to function well. So that is what I would like to add to this uh, bit of the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. And Marcus, I see you unmuted earlier, which I encouraged our panelists to unmute and make this a conversation. Um, what, what about you? Can you talk about what a just and, and circular plastics economy looks like for you? 
Yeah, and, and thanks, Sonia and Joshua, for your comments. I think I just want to build on this. Uh, uh, inclusion for me is really broad uh, because I think it's a joint responsibility. I think no one can solve the plastics issue alone. I think it's a, it's a joint uh, cooperation of, of, of governments actually providing the right uh, legal framework. It's us uh, as uh, plastics producers who need to work on innovation uh, bringing down, so to say, the CO2 footprints, uh, making sure our products are more sustainable. Uh, it's the packaging producers who need to work on, on lightweight packaging. It's the brand owners who need to accommodate it, but also to, to potentially avoid uh, packaging or, or make it light at least and sustainable. And uh, it's the retailers who also need to provide the platform that, uh, that people can select and have the choice. Yeah? And at the end, it's also the consumer who has a dramatic power in selecting products which are either not packed or sustainable to avoid unnecessary plastic waste and coming to the inclusion of of uh, of, uh, of waste pickers of course there are uh, many countries where there's kind of official formal waste uh, waste collection systems uh, and are well established even there uh, we need to build on people actually uh, sorting the waste and making sure that the waste collection works efficiently. Uh, it will help the whole recycling uh, chain to get out with good recycled products. But we also have to be aware there are quite many regions in the world where uh, they're quite remote. There's not a lot of infrastructure. And I think here the, the informal waste pickers, they play a very, very important role. So I would see them as complementing all the efforts that we're all doing, uh, helping us to, to make our planet uh, uh, more clean. And they do play a very important role. Thank you, Marcus. I want to return to each of you now and better understand what are some projects you're taking on um, to tackle this issue. And, and maybe we'll start with Marcus, if that's all right, because I know you're working on Project STOP, which is all about creating a more circular waste management system um, globally in emerging and developing regions in particular uh, in order to stop ocean plastics at the source. So can you tell us more about Project STOP and then um, other panelists, feel free to jump in in terms of the specifics on what you're working on to promote not just a more sustainable plastics economy, but a more equitable plastics economy. So we'll start with Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So I think uh, thanks for the opportunity to share what we're doing here. Uh, several years ago, ago we, we, we took the responsibility being a plastics producer. We are aware that we have to kind of uh, make our contribution. So we, with our partner Systemic, uh, we established a, a kind of a, a project in Indonesia. We started with actually three cities. We are actually building up a waste collection system, which means that we work together with local governments to actually help them with our expertise and Systemic's expertise to, to, to set the framework where you can actually collect waste. Uh, we, we do some funding also with, uh, with sponsors who help us uh, with funds to build up an infrastructure uh, to actually collect and, and, uh, and work on the waste. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, awareness and training of people. Um, and, uh, and, and by that, we avoid that, that waste actually uh, meets the ocean. That was the ultimate goal, to avoid uh, littering to the ocean. But of course, it has a primary effect that uh, waste in the cities becomes less. Yeah? And to give you some numbers, uh, in the three cities, we have uh, served uh, over 200,000 people who now live in a much better environment because it's it's uh, less waste uh, out there. So it's all uh, collected and, uh, and, and used. Uh, and we've collected 14,000 tons of waste and there of 2,000 have been plastic. And this normally would have actually entered sooner or later into the sea. And we're all aware of the, the issues that it creates there. So, so this uh, material has been avoided to, to make, meet the sea and it's used for something uh, for recycling. And I think one important topic is uh, we've created more than 200 jobs because it's not our intention to employ our people. So what we do, we create jobs for local people. Um, because at the end, um, we will hand over uh, the whole system towards the local community. So it, it will need to be sustainable. We help them. There's a slow release that uh, until they can fully own it. But the intention is to, to fully release it into their ownership. And then we can move on to the next city. So it's actually a kind of a open source system where we, all, we also learn, of course, with our partners and from, from the local communities. But we can actually replicate this whole concept to other cities in Indonesia. And, um, and that's a great learning opportunity. Uh, we partner up also with other companies. Uh, it's really something um, walking the talks 
So of course, you, it, it's a very hands-on project, uh, and we're quite proud of it. Uh, of course, this project alone doesn't solve the plastics issue, but it helps us to to set a signal and to motivate others uh, to also contribute. Um, and and that's we are quite proud of it. But actually, it's creating. Uh, jobs. I think some of the informal waste pickers uh, have found jobs here, so we can also create a, a more stable environment and also give them a kind of a, a good frame to have a good living and also for their families, their cleaner cities for sure will increase the, the quality of life. Thank you, Marcus. Sonia, Josh would love to bring you into this and hear not only what you're working on within your own organizations, but maybe how you're linking up with corporates, governments, other actors on this issue. Um, whoever would like to jump in, go for it. Maybe thank Sonia? You. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, part of Wigo's work is on documentation, research, and statistics about informal workers at large, and particularly mm -hmm. uh, way speakers. And all of that for us is to, to strengthen the uh, voices of the workers-based organizations, cooperative movements, federations, uh, unions of way speakers, uh, with and also to support raise the visibility uh, in 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 the global arena and also at national, subnational, and local levels. So, in this sense, we. We have different programs. One of our programs, which uh, is which push for more inclusive solid waste systems at the local level, is the Focal Cities uh, uh, program, and we have cities in Latin America, in Asia, and in Africa, in which we have dedicated legal uh, uh, staff working alongside governments and other uh, players, important players. Another project that uh, I want to uh, uh, raise attention on is the reducing waste for coastal cities. And this project, we are particularly addressing uh, the uh, role and contribution of waste speakers in, in curbing uh, pollution at the, our oceans. And we have developed a calculator of, uh, for uh, uh, assessing the contribution of waste speakers in the reduction of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Also, we have a whole uh, uh, line of work in terms of the strengthening the technical capacity and, and also the internal democracy of these organizations. Uh, another line of work uh, is our, uh, our work with alliances, multi-stakeholder alliances, such as uh, the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network, the Circular uh, Capital Initiative, and the Circular Action Hub, amongst others, in which we sit on the board, advisory board of these alliances, with the goal of highlighting livelihoods as a central issue in this debate and contributing in devising uh, frameworks for assessing their contributions. So I'll, I guess I'll stop there. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, and looking forward to soon transitioning to where do we go from here? You know, you've kind of outlined what you're working on, some of the successes you're having, challenges you're encountering, but now where do we go from here? But first, Josh, can you just um, yeah. delve into some more specifics on how you're working to tackle this issue? No, thank you very much. And I hope you can still hear me because it's raining cats and dogs outside here. Um, in terms of works uh, that we're actually doing on the ground specifically, um, it's very in line with what I said before. I think what we're doing is working together with municipalities, uh, district assemblies in Ghana, uh, also in Mali. And the, the core of that work is for them to formalize the work of the informal sector, where formalization means not making it too complicated, but that means that putting them together, being able to document waste workers, put an identity to the work they do, because the reality is that when an informal waste worker walks, walks to a home to take waste, the way they are treated is very different from when a formal company comes to their truck and parks in front of their house 
and says we are here to pick up the waste. And this is sort of a fundamental part of the work that we are doing to make sure that the waste workers, when they go about every day doing their work, there is dignity to the work they do, there is value to the work they do, and they have self-respect to the work they do because this is important for everyone else. And if the formal side of the, of the conversation do not feel and have these challenges, they shouldn't have the same challenges because it's the same way. So if someone in a, in a, in a, in a uniform walks to a house and people pay the money and load the truck and everything goes smooth, we do not expect that when an informal worker works into the home, they get insulted, looked down upon, or get comments which are really downgrading. So this is the part of the work that we do, giving them that identity, registering them, putting documentation behind the work they do, making sure that they have access to health insurance, Particularly during the time of the COVID, we realized that contracting is very important for the work they do, such that when there is any disruption in the flow of work in a community, in a city, they are protected. They have a contract which still gives them a basic access to income uh, so that they can still have a livelihood and they have that social protection in terms of um, yeah, when there, are, when there are sort of disasters or any chaos happen on the ground. The other part of the conversation that the work we're doing with the informal waste workers is giving them a place where they can meet and work. This is very important. When you look at the formal side, there is an office, there is a place for people to meet and discuss, to strategize, to plan. And if you look at the informal side, it's really sort of individuals. Maybe they meet on the road, they meet at the landfill site, they are picking, they are talking. But that environment is not conducive for a group of 100 people to really sit and have a conversation, to plan, to strategize, to decide on pricing. So that is very important, and that is the kind of uh, work that we are doing. But this is not something we can do as an NGO. It's something that we do with the local government, that they designate a site where we can bring in resources to develop that site to be conducive for them. We can offer, for instance, some of the training we are offering uh, is around management, right? People management. How do you manage people in the informal sector? So when a formal company wants to work with some of this informal uh, uh, sector, it's very difficult for them because the communication is on different levels. The understanding is different level. They want them to bring a particular documentation information, which is difficult to gather that. And we are training some of the formal counterparts on how they can work better with the informal economy. At the same time, training the informal economy on some of the standards and practices uh, which ensure safety uh, um, and, and working conducively uh, uh, with each other as colleagues and also how to engage better uh, with the formal sector and the municipalities and the local government offices. Thank you very much, and I'll, I'll pause here. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. And I see, um, before we continue our conversation with our panelists, I see that the Honorable Minister has raised her hand, which I love to see. So, uh, Ms. Minister Mujawa Maria, did you have something you wanted to contribute? We'd love to hear from you. Yes. Uh, th thank you very much, Catherine. I, I wanted just to, uh, to add on what Joshua has said. Even now in Rwanda, we pay the, the, the workers to come and collect our waste, house, household waste. But from now on, at least starting by January, uh, let's say latest uh, May next year, those uh, cleaners or those companies that are in the recycling industry will start paying us. Not we paying them to come and collect the waste. They will start paying us because the waste that we produce in our homes, in our household, will be a basic material for their industry. So this will encourage families to do the sorting at the origin of the waste. Those who will want, for example, plastic waste, will come and pay us per kilogram because we are giving them the material for the functioning of their industry. And from that, we will be encouraging our population, not only for sorting, and we will be encouraging our population to go to no waste is wasted. At the same time, our population will be encouraged to, to saving. Having an account in a bank 
where the, uh, the, the recycling industry will deposit the money for you. And of course, a, a, clean, a clean city will give us a green country. From those money our people are receiving, they will buy seedlings to plant trees and to increase the forest coverage in our country. And let me tell you what we are, we are fighting now for is to have alternative source, alternative packaging, because we have, we have banned plastic bags, but the industry of creation of alternative packaging, for example, for meat, I mean, for wet product, we have to find, I mean, alternative packaging. That's why we are calling investors to come and invest in Rwanda in producing alternative packaging for our population. And having a clean city or a clean country does not require financing. It requires determination and the resilience to have a clean community, to have a clean city, to have a clean and a, a green nation. And we can do it. We have to be the change we want to see in this world. And we can do it by fighting plastic pollution. And I'm sure if we all, from all the corner of the world, we say no to plastic pollution, we can't say no to plastic because we have all items like chairs that are in plastic. We have to say no to plastic pollution, no to marine litter, plastic marine litter. But what we have to say is no waste should be wasted. Everything should be transformed. I'm a chemist and I know in chemistry, nothing is wasted. Everything is transformed. That's why, as human beings, we have to protect humanity by fighting plastic pollution. I thank you very much. I'm sorry, I have to leave for another meeting. I understand, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around and thank you so much for, for listening and, and for that powerful call to action. We really appreciate it. Looking, follow, looking forward to following what you do in this space. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We have a few great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, so I wanna move to those and keep them coming in the chat uh, or on Slido. And I wanna note, it's noted in the chat that Slido is anonymous if you prefer to ask your questions. Anonymously, that's a great place to do it. Let me go ahead and move to some of these questions. So I'll, I'll pose the first and um, panelists, I would encourage you to unmute, jump in and let's make this a conversation. Here's the question. The informal sector is automatically associated with low income or low educated individuals. How can we work to disassociate those prejudices? Who'd like to jump in on that? If I, I may. To... Oh, sorry, please go ahead. All right, all right, go ahead. okay. Um, I mean, when, when you said the question, the first thing that came to my head was, we can jump this and move it to a different conversation if we actually, first of all, acknowledge that there is a gap. So saying that they are all sort of um, low income, I think that is what we need to acknowledge. Acknowledging that means we can make better investments into the work that they do, into their livelihood, and to upgrade that. The second part is really seeing it as the way you would organize executive leadership training, executive MBA, executive whatever courses for the formal sector. We need to tailor different programs, different training capacities for the informal economy as well, so we can upgrade them. And then the third thing is really advocating. I've seen a lot of you know, plastics and circular economy innovation challenge that has happened over the last two years and barely do any of them target the informal economy. Most of them are really targeted towards sort of tech related uh, innovations or innovations that are really sort of um, uh, uh, government led or company led. And if you are being honest with ourselves, if the, if the, if the informal waste sector is not organized in the form of a company that has a registration, automatically they are even cut off these opportunities. So the money is coming out, the many initiatives that are coming out that is supporting sort of the just transi the transition itself and the plastics economy, we need to make it just by having dedicated 
financing programs that target the informal economy, that acknowledges what sort of the, uh, the, the areas where they cannot compete with the formal side, upscale them towards that level, and be able to provide support for them. This means that you do not expect them to write a proposal to get funding. This means that you dedicate someone who works along with them, hear their story, put that on paper, and be able to finance them. Because we cannot put them on the same scale and say that, oh, there is funding for uh, a circular economy and everyone has have, have access to have, have accessibility to it. And acknowledging that is very important to make sure that we are providing the support and ensuring that there's a level of equity uh, in assessing these resources and, and pushing the, the sector and the individuals towards the next level. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Marcus, I see you're, you have your hand raised. Go ahead and jump in. Yeah, and I just wanted to build on what uh, what Josh says. Actually, um, I think what's important, and I think that's maybe that's a provocative statement, but I think I want to drive also some mindset shift because how I see waste is at the end, you can see waste as a raw material just being at the wrong place, right? And how we do see it with the whole level of circularity, uh, actually in future, we all need to, we all want to actually stick to the, the Paris Agreement and there's no no way uh, actually to reduce fossil in, in the plastics industry. And the way we also see the circularity, actually we should as much as we can reuse uh, only then what we cannot use a uh, mechanical recycle because that has the best sort of say uh, life cycle footprint and then uh, go towards chemical recycling and only what what uh, cannot be chemical recycled in future will be other routes and whatever then sort of say is left in the chain we talk ideally we top up with uh, renewable feedstock so the long-term vision should be actually to move away from fossils and have this full circularity and there's one element and, and that's where the element I want to build on what Josh said actually I think we need to mindset why move away that, that waste is something negative and it's not well paid. Actually, uh, waste collection and recycling will be one of the value streams in, in future. And we need to find a way how we actually fund it. And there are three areas I would see actually where we all need to come need to come better is actually one that actually paying for the waste. Uh, because it's a raw material. I think that's already, uh, and we try to establish that in Indonesia. There's one element which is uh, plastics credit, where that's uh, supported programs where those who actually recycle, uh, they will get money for this recycled material, which will help them to create more jobs and actually expand their recycling equipment and plants. And the third element is the EPR, which is the extended producer responsibility, where all the ones who produce plastics and we are committed to that, should have a kind of a, a subsidized or a fund actually that uh, waste is actually collected and actually is recycled. So everyone in the chain needs to have a contribution and ideally um, this, this kind of value, the money we put in the system because actually we make out products out of it. Yeah? So there needs to be value of this waste. It should go down in the chain, uh, down to the, to the pickers um, because they are the ones uh, who normally get the least, but they do a very important job. Uh, so we need to make sure by establishing the right systems that the money we put in for this raw material, which now we call waste, is really reaching the pickers because we need them and it's a, it's an important work. Thank you, Marcus. And so I want to give you the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I know you and Josh both jumped in initially, so please jump in. Okay. Yes, I think uh, one thing, uh, and I think it builds uh, actually from what uh, Joshua mentioned. Uh, one key thing is investment in building formal workers' capacity to deliver in complementarity with formal solid waste systems. And uh, to that end, you know, one concrete example is the example of my country. I'm Brazilian. And in 1998, we initiated uh, under auspices of UNICEF Brazil, a program called the National Waste and Citizenship uh, program. This was, in fact, a multi-stakeholder alliance with uh, governments, waste pickers, organizations, civil society, and industries represented in this multi-stakeholder forum. And we started a major capacity building uh, program in which we not only built capacity for waste pickers to get organized into cooperatives, 
but also to change the mindsets of, of the government representatives and industry. Because most often, government officials and the industry think of modernization of solid waste as something related to capital intensive, use uh, uh, technology, uh, waste to energy, and they don't build from what already exists, which is the informal systems. So, you know, building a capacity in a program that is comprehensive, that involves most stakeholder uh, uh, actors, that uh, not only encourage uh, the formation of organizations of waste speakers, but also create funding lines for them to access, you know, resources that enable them to buy equipment and build sorting places and, and address occupation and health, uh, 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 OHS issues is fundamental. So just in a nutshell, uh, is what I wanted to add. And the example of Brazil is well documented. I have uh, many papers about it for those interested to follow up on it. Thank you, Sonia. And yeah, the chat is a great place to include those resources and, and build connections for follow-up. Uh, I just want to note, I see some hands that are raised. Um, and in a moment, we'll be transitioning from this recorded portion of the conversation into a conversation under the Chatham House rule, and we'll get to more of those voices. We also have a couple questions that have come in that we haven't had the chance yet to get to. We will get to them. Those questions include one on plastic credits, another on uh, increasing representation of vulnerable populations uh, in decision-making processes within the plastics value chain. Um, I just wanna thank those of you who are, who are here with us uh, watching the recorded portion of this event for your time and thank you to our panelists. And we were tasked today with talking about shaping a just plastics economy, what's already happening and what further action is needed. And I think you all have provided us with really helpful examples and insights from around the world. Uh, so again, that concludes the recorded portion of this event. Now we'll transition into a conversation under the Chatham House rule, where we can bring even more voices into this discussion. So thank you so much. And for those of you who can, please stick with us.